Hello everybody, welcome back. This is case study number 29, an adult patient coming in with diplopia and weakness. If you haven't had the chance yet, please consider subscribing to my Patreon. Uh, you can get there by clicking the link in the description of the video or on the I button in the upper right hand corner. I really appreciate all the contributions I can get and I thank all of you who have already donated and those of you who are considering it. Okay, we got a 31-year-old white woman who's coming into the clinic complaining of vision problems over the last two weeks. She says that she gets double vision after spending about 10 to 15 minutes reading or using the computer, after which she needs to stop reading or close her eyes for a few minutes before being able to read again. So this is not something permanent. This is something um, that goes away and comes back. It's intermittent. Um, so she's never had any vision problems in the past and does not use glasses or contacts. She says that she also has some generalized weakness and fatigue, and she says that she has, quote, a hard time making it through the day, so progressive fatigue. Occasionally she has difficulty eating dinner because her jaw gets weak. She's got no significant past medical history and is generally in good health. She works as an actuary for an insurance company. She doesn't drink, smoke, or use illicit drugs. She's sexually monogamous with her husband and uses birth control. Family history is significant for a sister with RA. And her medications include the levonorgestrel IUD, which is the Mirena uh, IUD, and a multivitamin. And her vitals are within normal limits and her weight is normal. All right, what are we going to do for physical exam? All right, her general appearance is fatigued appearing, H-E-N-T. All right, we really want to, observe, we want to take a look at her eyes and see if there's anything abnormal grossly. So we're going to check her visual acuity. She's 2040 in her left and her right eyes. She's got a normal fundoscopic exam. Her pupils are equally round and reactive to light and accommodation. Extraocular muscles are intact, um, and um, her neck is supple, and there's no thyroid enlargement or lymphadenopathy. Uh, lungs, heart, abdomen are all fine. Neurologically, her muscle strength is plus 5 out of 5 in all extremities, but decreases to 3, point, or to three over 5 on repeat examination after a couple minutes. So she's getting some weakness after exertion. Uh, she's got some weakness on eye closure, so muscles, some of those small muscles in the face are problematic, but she's got normal gait, cranial nerves are otherwise normal, and she's got normal deep, deep tendon reflexes. All right, what is our differential? So it's not a very big differential. She's got some small muscle weakness, and so typically what we think of with that is myasthenia gravis and Lambert-Eaton syndrome. Uh, so these are the two big things that we're considering. Uh, these present kind of this way. Another one is botulism um, because of the fact that it does have muscle weakness as a presenting feature. We do need to consider it. And then hypothyroidism typically doesn't cause muscle weakness, but it can cause fatigue and sort of a general weakness uh, picture. Um, so that is also something to consider. So now that we know that this is our differential, what are we going to do for workup? Remember on CCS, come up with your differential, then pick the labs that you want to do. Otherwise, you're going to be, sh uh, you know, just shotgunning your labs. All right, so we are going to get an acetylcholine receptor antibody. That is to diagnose myasthenia gravis. Because she's got this, you know, these, the, these muscle uh, weakness signs, uh, we want to get an EMG. Uh, you don't have to, but it would be good for completion's sake. And then because we're considering the possibility of hypothyroidism, we're going to get a TSH. So what do we find? Her acetylcholine receptor antibody is positive. Her EMG shows a decreasing response amplitude upon repetitive stimulation, meaning that the the conduction, the, the muscle uh, response is getting weaker the more that she uses the muscle, uh, the more that the, um, the electrical impulse sends uh, a uh, signal to the muscle to contract, uh, and her TSH is within normal limits. So this picture is myasthenia gravis. Now, we will need to do a further workup on this patient because the majority of patients with myasthenia gravis will have abnormalities of their thymus. 
Now, remember, the thymus doesn't really do anything in, um, in adults. Um, it's more in, uh, in neonates and fetuses. Um, so it is something we want to look at. Um, so we are going to get a chest CT. Now, some people will say chest x-ray. You could probably get by with that, but I would prefer uh, to go with a chest CT. Then we're also going to get a TSH if it's not already done because hyperthyroidism can cause this sort of weakness. Now, we already did our TSH, uh, but it's something that you would want to include um, as part of your further workup if you haven't done it already. Now, the treatment for myasthenia gravis is pyridostigmine. Pyridostigmine is a, an acetylcholine esterase inhibitor, so it increases the amount of acetylcholine at the synapse and can outcompete those antibodies. Now, I just want to go back. Uh, the diagnostic test is that receptor antibody um, uh, uh, assay. You do not do the Tensilon test. Administering edrophonium, don't do that. Okay, that is the wrong answer. Um, step one probably went into that a little bit, but you do not do that to diagnose myasthenia gravis. Now, along with the pyridostigmine, if that is not effective by itself, then we can add on either steroids or immunosuppressants like azathioprine, but we would go for monotherapy first. Now, if there are thymic features, if there's hyperplasia or a thymoma, um, or if we have the patient on pyridostigmine and immunosuppressants and it does not, again, does not respond, um, then we can do a thymectomy. Uh, and so for that, you would consult general surgery and just put in the orders that she needs a thymectomy. Um, so in addition to pyridostigmine, you could also use neostigmine too. That's an acceptable answer. Um, now, if the patient starts to develop respiratory distress, meaning they've got difficulty breathing, this is going to be a minority of MG patients, but some of them will develop this, um, then what you need to do is plasma exchange or IVIG, uh, and then you need to consider the possibility of intubation, and you would decide whether you need to do that based on the patient's clinical appearance. Are they gurgling? Are they having a hard time getting rid of their secretions? Are they in respiratory distress? Um, and then you would intubate those patients. Um, it's ideal to intubate them prophylactically if they start showing signs before they start going into frank respiratory distress. So keep that in mind. Sometimes you may need to do that. And then this patient will be referred to neurology for long-term management. So MG is a neuroimmunologic disorder. It's a type 2 hypersensitivity, meaning you're making antibodies against parts of your body, against your own tissue, in which autoantibodies bind to acetylcholine receptors at the NMJ, resulting in small muscle and proximal muscle weakness that characteristically worsens with exertion. We'll go into why that's important to differentiate. It's associated with fatigue and dysphagia, so sometimes they can have problems uh, chewing their food and swallowing their food. The best initial diagnostic step is the acetylcholine receptor antibody assay, uh, but the EMG is going to be the most sensitive test. Now, if the acetylcholine receptor antibody assay comes back negative and you still suspect myasthenia gravis, then you can get this muscle-specific kinase antibody assay. It's a little bit more sensitive. Um, <clears throat> so you may want to consider that uh, too. But on CCS, acetylcholine receptor antibody assay, it will probably give you your results. Now, once the diagnosis is established, you need to ascertain whether there's a thymoma or thymic hyperplasia. So we would get the CT chest. And if there is thymic abnormalities, then you will proceed with a thymectomy. The first line of management is pyridostigmine. Immunosuppressants are added on if that's not successful by itself. Now, myasthenic crisis. Some patients could be short of breath or tachypneic. This is a myasthenic crisis, which is a medical emergency. Uh, if the patient's in respiratory distress or unable to handle their secretions, then you'll proceed with intubation, although the technical indication for intubation is a forced vital capacity of less than 15 mils per kilogram. There are uh, little handheld devices, typically in most ERs, that you can do some spirometry to determine you know, whether they're in this range. These patients with myasthenic crisis will need to be admitted um, and then you will do plasma exchange and or IVIG. Some common differentials, 
Lambert Eaton syndrome is like a reverse MG in that they'll have weakness, but the more that they activate uh, those those that that synapse, that neuromuscular synapse, uh, the stronger they'll get. Uh, and so the reason is because this is antibodies directed towards the voltage-gated calcium channels. So you would get that as an assay. And then once you diagnose this, you want to look for underlying malignancy. So again, you're getting a chest CT, but here you're not looking for thymoma. You're looking for lung cancer because lung cancer is the most common cancer that would cause Lambert-Eaton syndrome. Botulism affects similar muscles and it can cause diplopia, decreased visual acuity, um, but it tends to also cause mydriasis and also some of these more systemic features, uh, autonomic features like hypotension, bradycardia. They can also have uh, issues with their smooth muscle, which would cause constipation uh, due to decreased motility and urinary retention. And then hypothyroidism also causes weakness and fatigue, but does not typically cause weakness of the bulbar and ocular muscles. So to recap, myasthenia gravis is where autoantibodies bind to acetylcholine receptors at the NMJ which typically results in small muscle, think ocular and bulbar uh, weakness, um, but it can also cause proximal muscle weakness and could also go on to uh, cause uh, respiratory muscle weakness. It classically worsens with exertion. You've got to know that. There's an association with thymic issues. Um, and so for, for that reason, we're ultimately going to need to get a chest CT in all these patients. The best initial test is the acetylcholine receptor antibody assay. The most sensitive test is EMG. Always get a chest CT upon diagnosis. Routine management is pyrotostigmine. Add immunosuppressants if there's no response. You do a thymectomy for patients with thymic anomalies or as definitive management if they're not responding to medical treatment. Keep an eye out for respiratory distress uh, slash myasthenic crisis. Intubate these patients if necessary. And if they need to be intubated, then you need to give plasma exchange and or IVIG.